Sorry, I'm a Mac person, so. <laughs> I wish you were both MacMaster and Mac. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Today, I don't know if you can do anything but the uh, screen talk. I tried. I know, I know. It's, it's the connection here, it's loose, so. You want, a, you want another Mac connector? No, it's not a, uh, it's not a Mac. It's an HDMI. Yeah, yeah. It's an HDMI connection. That, Goes in and out. Goes in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I have to apologize because I'm going to uh, expose you to another acronym. It's one of the things about doing international labor <laughs> thing is you get bombarded by ac acronyms. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about a different organization, which the acronym is uh, SIGTOR. It stands for the Southern Initiative on Globalization and Trade Union Rights. And what I'm going to talk to you. Today comes out of a, a larger study. Um, so I've been following this organization since the late 1990s, and I want to just tell you a little bit about the organization and some of the challenges uh, that it faces. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the second. Oh, you can't see. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of labor internationalism, but very, very briefly, and then get on to the case study and talk about the organization itself, then uh, the tensions within the organization, some of the responses to those tensions, and then conclude with an evaluation. Okay, so the arguments uh, I want to make is, is, first of all, that this organization um, has uh, experienced very slow progress. and. Uh, has faced daunting um, practicalities in trying to bridge different localities. Uh, the task remains essential, but the, the obstacles are large. The second argument is uh, I talk a bit about its accomplishments, which are mainly about building a space where people can meet and uh, educate each other about uh, their realities, uh, think a little bit about uh, developing alternatives, and um, engage in some limited uh, cooperation. The challenges it faces, I have to go fast. The challenges it faces are uh, limited capacity to act, um, limited commitment, and also a, capac a problem of trying to reach out to more people, and especially, uh, you were talking about this, of how do you reach out to people in kind of the rank of file. Okay, so the background context is to think a little bit about um, concepts of neorealism and autonomy and the contradiction of the times that we live in, which is, uh, on the one hand, uh, the autonomy of labor groups being undermined, but on the other hand, the openings, transnational openings and possibilities of increased contact and increased cooperation and how labor can respond to those things. So, Maybe we could just remove it because it's really affecting it's the audience. Eyes. Yeah, you could see it because, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll stop, stop with that. Yeah. But then you don't get to see the pictures. Yeah, oh, but it's okay. really... Right. Don't, okay. don't no pictures. Computer. Eh? Can I try? Can I try another computer? I have one here. Uh, we don't know if it's the computer or if it's wow. the cord. Well, let's try another computer. Yeah, because it's really difficult. Uh -huh. Shoot the map. Can I Sure. Yeah, uh, it's not a Mac. Do you have an HDMI? So internationalism, labor internationalism, briefly, we have the optimists who think that it can accomplish many things and we're on the age of a new internationalism. And we have the pessimists who think that it's basically a waste of time. The group that I'm looking at, again, it's called SIGTOR, Southern Initiative on Globalization and Trade Union Rights. Its origins are in the early 1990s. And uh, it developed out of a relationship between trade unions in Western Australia, left trade unions in Western Australia, and trade unions in South Africa. And there was a number of circumstances that facilitated uh, these interactions. So the end of the Cold War was important. The uh, anti-apartheid actions 
in uh, South Africa and the solidarity shown in Western Australia was important, but also then the uh, Australian government's attack on basic labor rights, especially in Western Australia, but across Australia uh, in general, allowed for what you might think of as reverse solidarity in which South Africans came to Western Australia and expressed their outrage at what the Australian government was doing to, to labor rights. It then spreads from this bilateral relationship to what was called an Indian Ocean Initiative. So it took in countries such as uh, India, <coughs> Indonesia, the Philippines, and then it spreads again to other countries, uh, to South Korea, and then uh, finally makes it to the Americas uh, with Brazil and Argentina. Really nice picture here of the logos <laughs> of the different <laughs> unions that are in, uh, engaged. But essentially it's, uh, it's left, uh, left-wing unions uh, in India and in Brazil, in um, Argentina, in the Philippines, in South Korea, uh, South Africa, and then uh, the Australian uh, left-wing unions. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the tensions in this uh, organization. So the first one, uh, which goes back to something that Thomas said, was uh, about articulating, articulating an identity. Who are they? What's their commonality? Uh, is there a way that they can work across national boundaries? Are there things that they can agree on? So they have a statement of who they are, which they say that they are a campaign-oriented network of democratic unions in the South. Right? So they're campaign oriented, they claim to be democratic, and they're based in the, in the South. Now, there are some issues with that definition. Okay? So one is the Southern aspect of the definition, because no matter how you define South, there are members of this group that don't really fit the South. So uh, the South Koreans are Yes, they're in the south, they're in the south of Korea. Uh, but, you know, in other respects, they're in an advanced industrialized economy. Um, the Australians, of course, are also geographically in the south, but they are a white settler society, much like Canada is. Um, so it's hard to think about how they, they might be southern. Uh, they're all leftist, as I mentioned, but what that means is radically different in the context. So, if you're uh, Situ in India, uh, or you're the KMU in the Philippines, your uh, outlook on life is quite different than if you're in Western Australia, or if you're in uh, South Africa, or if in, you're in Brazil. So there's a huge <coughs> difference in uh, political orientations. Um, their identity is democratic, but if you look at the various groups, you'll see that democratic means different things. Uh, some are independent from political parties, some are dominated by political parties. Uh, they are all uh, trade unions, but they have very different relationships with non-trade unions, with uh, non-governmental organizations and labor activists. Some of them are very open to working with them, some of them are more jealous about their representative role. Um, they have a common identity as producers uh, in the sense that they, their members make things, but one of the things they haven't explored as much or sufficiently is their identity as consumers and their role in uh, the process of consuming and how that influences labor relations. Uh, they have a commitment to equality in many forms. Uh, they have a, a written and rhetorical uh, commitment to gender equality. But in terms of um, actual practice, they fall short uh, many times, despite uh, their efforts. Okay, so that's one issue, uh, is about identity. Who are they and how do they negotiate that? Another issue is about how do they communicate across cultures? How do they communicate across language? How do they communicate across different histories? Um, so language is an issue. Uh, the working language is English, which is okay for Australians, South Africans, uh, and most Indians, although there are quite a few Indians who don't speak English, um, but it's a big issue for, uh, for other groups and how they interact with each other, relying on translators, sometimes things having to go through two or three different levels of translating, slows, uh, slows discussion and debate. It's also a huge issue in organizational cultures, 
when they get together, how they interact with each other. So you have some which are very patriarchal and hierarchical. You have others which are, com from the outside, seem to be completely disorganized and, and, uh, and chaotic. And when you're dealing with difficult issues of substance, those kind of organizational cultural differences get in the way of people being able to communicate because you interpret things, or you can interpret things uh, incorrectly. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the different of history, uh, the role that history's played, the role that colonialism has played in terms of how people interpret events. So in one of the meetings, there was a, a very um, difficult discussion about the war in Africa. Yeah, so there's an article on, on trade, and unions of trade. There's an article on uh, climate change and what a, uh, a different situation would look like. There's uh, an article on kind of public service restructuring and what alternatives might be, and then there's an article on um, tax abuse, global tax abuse, and how that affects uh, unions, uh, particularly in, in, in Africa. So this is a, a, a something that they've produced, and it's um, meant to be distributed to affiliates and to rank and file members. Um, there's questions in it uh, for discussion uh, purposes. Okay. So uh, I'll just finish quickly with kind of accomplishments and um, obstacles. So accomplishments really have been, again, about creating a new space for discussion and exchange uh, and learning, which I think is really important. Um, there's so much lack of understanding between various unions from different parts of the world about the kind of um, experiences that they uh, face. So that's an important thing. Uh, there's a sharing of organizational experience. There is solidarity, especially to um, some of the more unorganized workers in different parts of the world. And also, I think it is important a space to try and develop an alternative vision or a utopian vision, uh, because labor is often on the defensive, uh, and uh, you need to think a little bit about well, these aren't we don't just oppose, but we also we also propose. We had some ideas. Okay, problems. Um, one is uh, capacity. Uh, they're always strapped for resources, trying to bolt money on from national federations or seek other uh, sources of uh, funding. Um, it's unclear, uh, national federations, how committed they are to the project. Sometimes they are, sometimes, uh, sometimes they aren't. Uh, especially when uh, members face um, domestic challenges. So you know, since the 1990s, uh, these unions have enjoyed better times and worse times. Now, in most of the countries, it's worse times, so that limits what they can do internationally. There's the issue about reaching down um, through the union structures to try and um, get more rank and file people aware. But despite all of these problems, I think the interesting thing is that you know the, the demand or the need for the organization continues, right? The problems don't go away. The transnationalization of capital, the internationalization of, of regulation, those continue uh, pace. So don't really have an alternative but to try and find a way through these difficulties. Okay, so the issue about whether um, these kind of new labor communities can um, be solidified or strengthened or grow um, uh, remains in the air. And Sictor is just one organization of many that's uh, that's working on it. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards. I have a book manuscript that's almost ready, so I can talk for hours if you really want to.